Kieran Rooney uh, from the University of Sydney, who's a biochemist. And uh, he also, I, I met him when I found myself over in Sydney at uh, the start of the year. Um, and he kept me sane by uh, meeting up with me and uh, having a few regular coffees. Um, and uh, it was nice to share this idea that uh, drugs aren't the answer to everything as I was getting at my workplace. So uh, thanks, Karen. Thank you. I should say thank you to Simon as well because it was nice to have a sane person in Sydney for a little while to talk to and catch up with as well. Um, my name's Kieran. Uh, it's been 15 hours since my last carbohydrate. Um, <laughs> and uh, this is CA, isn't it, Sarah? Um, as Simon said, I'm a biochemist, uh, which means it's a, a professional obligation of mine to make something relatively simple relatively difficult. Um, <laughs> But what I'm going to try and do is give a simplified overview of actually where Troy has beautifully built us into, um, which if we had tried to plan it better, we probably wouldn't have. Um, Simon said when he first invited me over to have a chat, he, we came up with this innocuous uh, you know, science behind low-carb, high-fat nutrition. And I wonder, well, what is it every you know, uh, low-carb, high-fat person is interested in? It's biochemistry. Um, and <laughs> in particular, well, as, as Troy was saying, people say you need 130 grams of glucose a day or carbohydrate a day for, for minimal functioning and what have you. And that's never necessarily sat well with me when I've come at things from my biochemistry point of view. And uh, I think when people talk about that, they neglect something that we've known for around about 50 odd years, um, which people refer to as the glucose fatty acid cycle. Some people also refer to it as the Randall cycle. And even though Rick's left, when I saw he was talking about the fat switch, I also like to refer to it as then the other fat switch, uh, as opposed to the polyol pathway that he was talking about. But it comes from a, a, an early theory from Randall, uh, Philip Randall, Eric Newsom, uh, very esteemed biochemist from Cambridge. And this phrase I've got from one of their papers, which locally derived fat that divide the carbohydrate or lipid metabolism, specifically inhibit the oxidation of the other. So hopefully what I get to you to understand in the next... 10 minutes, um, is that you'll see here how we make fat from carbohydrate and why when you're eating lots of carbs, you make lots of fat. But then on the other side, when you restrict your carbohydrates, how your body switches to burn more fat. Um, I'm going to give some biochemistry pathways, I have to, uh, but that way I see lots of people have notes and papers, so you might need a couple of different coloured pens. Um, <laughs> I have animated so we can walk through it carefully. But, I guess the, the, the brief background is this. 50 odd years ago, um, researchers coming out of Cambridge just uh, identified what they called as the glucose fatty acid cycle. Um, and this is by Sir Philip Randall and the group that he was working with. Essentially what they did was they took rat heart muscle, rat diaphragm muscle, put it into a test tube and mixed it up with a whole heap of fat. And then they snap froze the muscle and they measured what happened inside the muscles. And what they found was that there are certain markers that show, well, the tissues that were incubated in a solution full of fat didn't burn carbohydrate. And they called there, so then they identified specific pathways along carbohydrate metabolism that they said, well, fat inhibits it. And this became the glucose fatty acid cycle. Now, that stood relatively unchallenged for at least 30 years as the be all and end all as to where we get a switch between carbohydrate and fat metabolism. And I dare say you probably still come across chemistry te uh, biochemistry textbooks that still refer to the Randall cycle as explaining what happens in all tissues. But it doesn't explain what happens in all tissues. There are some limitations in extrapolating it to things like liver and muscle. And the big thing is this. It's not that it was rat tissue, but it was that it was heart and diaphragm muscle. And heart and diaphragm don't have glycogen, which is our natural store of carbohydrate. So when people have tried to reproduce the early studies in humans, and in skeletal muscle or in liver tissue, it doesn't really hold true. And that's what happened in the 90s by a group of Scandinavians. And ethics in Scandinavia must be far more relaxed than it is in Australia. Because what these experiments were doing was they were getting university students who had to volunteer for research studies. They would cannulate femoral arteries, <laughs> infuse emulsified lipid solutions, get them to exercise, and then while they were exercising, take skeletal muscle biopsies. <laughs> So it gave us a fascinating insight into how fat and carbohydrate talk to each other at rest 
and during exercise. And what they found is that muscle glycogen was a major player in regulating which fuels, fuels we select to use. But they also showed that, well, there were some aspects of the Randall cycle that worked and others that didn't. At around about the same time, another group were coming from a completely different angle. And they said, we're not necessarily sure it's specifically pathways along glycolysis or glucose metabolism, but we think the entry of fat into the mitochondria is specifically inhibited. And that's working around a molecule called malonyl-CoA. In rats, fantastic evidence. In humans, not so good. As it turns out, one of the ways that we're different is rats can produce thousands times more of this molecule than a human will. And so it's open to debate as to whether or not that pathway fits in. The reason why I bring that up is to say there's still no definitive mechanism by how we understand where glucose and fat get switched over. And so I'm going to give you a few complicated pathways, but we do know it does happen. And depending upon whether you're talking to exercise physiologists, cell physiologists, biochemists, chemists, or nutritionists and dietitians, they'll give you a different mechanism. I'm going to give you my top three or so. So this represents a generic cell. And for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to say it can any time be a liver or a skeletal muscle tissue. And I'm using those two because they are specifically where we store glycogen and they are vastly important, so intensely important for our whole body energy regulation. Now, when we're making energy in our cell, we use this component called the mitochondria. It's an organelle that's in it. Every cell in our body has mitochondria except for red blood cells. Now, we use these predominantly to make the energy that we need for our cell, which is ATP. We use oxygen to do that, but it's not just oxygen. We need other things from our food, from our molecules. We need electrons. And that's what we use this thing called the electron transport chain. And it's intrinsically linked to this thing called the Krebs cycle. Or if you read a different book, it'll be called the TCA cycle. If you're in another book, it'll be called the citric acid cycle. It all depends upon which book and who you're talking to. But effectively, the TCA cycle produces lots and lots of these molecules called NADH and FADH2. The H is a hydrogen atom. In biochemistry, we transfer energy through electrons, not necessarily through specific types of food when we get down to this level. So we have this system which is just constantly cycling the electrons. So the question to ask is, well, where are the electrons coming from? And the TCA cycle grabs them from this molecule called acetyl-CoA. So acetyl-CoA filters into the TCA cycle, produces these electrons. It also produces CO2. And we can measure this. This is how we can work out what your metabolic rate is. This is how we can determine what fuels you're utilising. Because I can put a mask over your face, I can measure how much CO2 you're breathing out, and I can measure how much oxygen you're consuming. And then depending upon the ratios of that, people have calculated that you get different amounts of consumption and production depending upon what fuels you're burning. And we can do that at rest, we can do that at exercise, we can do that following meals and what have you. So this is, the CO, this is where you produce the CO2 you're breathing out, and the reason why we consume oxygen is to keep these electron transport chain running. This acetyl-CoA becomes the pivotal point in metabolic biochemistry. So there are a couple of pathways for it. It will only enter the TCA cycle if we have an ATP demand. So that means if our cells don't require a lot of energy, it doesn't go into the TCA cycle to make the NADH to then make more ATP because the cell's like, I don't need any more of it. If you're a carbohydrate eater and have a moderate amount of it, then instead of going to make energy for the cell, it gets converted into citrate. And the cell doesn't like having citrate accumulating in its mitochondria, it's relatively toxic, so it pumps it back out into the side cell. And it sits there for a while, depending upon what other signals are around. If you're a low carb eater or carbohydrate restricted, and this was a liver cell, then typically what happens is the amount of TCA cycle you have is less. So there's not actually room for the, for the acetyl-CoA to get, produce the citrate and get leaves. You turn it into ketone bodies. And so your liver will take that acetyl-CoA, and if, there's not a high, if you're making more acetyl-CoA than you need to make ATP, you turn it into ketone bodies and you pump that back out into the system. The question then is where do we get the acetyl-CoA from? One source is from glucose or sugars. So effectively you have glucose comes through a specific glucose transporter, goes through glycolysis to make pyruvate, pyruvate enters your mitochondria and gets converted into acetyl-CoA. And we can either get glucose from our blood supply or we might have some stored glycogen. If we're producing the lactate quicker than the rate at which the TCA cycle is working, then we get it back up, the pyruvate stays in the cytosol and we produce lactate. And this is quite often what happens when you're reaching your maximal exercise capacity, 
or even if everybody's sitting here, as soon as you stand up to leave the room, you'll produce some lactate because the rate at which you've burnt some carbohydrate will be quicker than the rate at which you needed the energy to meet that need. So some lactate will be produced. The interesting thing is when we add insulin to the mix. Now, when you add insulin to the mix, you get enhanced stimulation of particular pathways. So the smiley faces represent where insulin makes something happen more than if it wasn't around. So in actuality, what we see, particularly in muscle and liver, is that insulin will stimulate more glucose into the cell. You'll also, therefore, make more pyruvate, you make a little bit more lactate, and you make more acetyl-CoA. Now, the catch with adiposity, the catch with energy balance is, if you're doing this without an increased need for ATP, the acetyl-CoA has nowhere to go but to make citrate. The citrate builds up into your cell. And what do you do with the citrate? When you have insulin around, it stimulates citrate to get converted into acetyl-CoA, which then gets converted into this thing called malonyl-CoA, and we use malonyl CoA to synthesize fat. So the key is whether or not there's an energy demand. Now, the thing is, most of us won't have insulin floating around at the same time as we have a high energy demand that will remove all the acetyl CoA away to utilize. If you exercise, you actually inhibit the amount of insulin you produce or secrete. Uh, more often than not, you will have insulin floating around at the same time as a whole heap of glucose, which means you've got ample TCA cycle, relatively lower metabolic need, so you'll store it as excess fat. And that's how we make our fat from our carbohydrates. What are some other sources of acetyl-CoA? Fat. Now, if we have fatty acids coming in through our blood supply, or we can have our endogenous stores of fat within our cell producing fatty acids, which then get transported into our mitochondria. Once they're in the mitochondria, we break those down into acetyl-CoA. Now, one of the other things that insulin does while it's stimulating our uh, storage of carbohydrates as fat, it specifically blocks two other things. It blocks the enzyme that breaks down stored fat, and it also blocks the transport mechanism to get fat into the mitochondria. Fat can't just readily pass in there. If you have a fatty acid that's longer than 14 carbons, it needs a specific transporter to grab it and bring it in. Medium chain fatty acids, short chain fatty acids are different. They transport in there by a different method. But if you have the long chain, which is a predominant fatty acid that we have in our stored fat, you need this transporter, which is highly sensitive to insulin. And what the people in the 90s showed us as well with all of their biopsies and fat emulsif emulsification was that malonyl-CoA also inhibits that fat transporter, which means if you have a lot of insulin floating around and you have a lot of malonyl-CoA floating around and you have glucose metabolism taking place, you block the specific transport of fat into the mitochondria. You don't block its import into the cell, though, which means the only thing that you can do with it is add it to the stores that you've got growing. There's another source of acetyl-CoA, though, and that's protein and amino acids. So we can take amino acids, which is our source of proteins that we're eating. They'll get transported into the cell. We don't store amino acids within our cell any other way than protein synthesis. So unless you're growing new cells, you won't store it. You will utilise them. If we're talking about exercise, people talk mostly about the branch chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine, which can feed straight into the TCA cycle and, and help generate energy. You also have what we call ketogenic amino acids, which will produce acetyl-CoA to drive ketone body production. And so what you see there is that the acetyl-CoA sits at the middle of all of our macronutrients. And what I like to teach our, to my students is people talk about balancing your carbohydrates, your fats, and your proteins. But when it comes to an energy metabolic state, once we get to acetyl-CoA, the body doesn't recognise it as being from fat, from carbohydrate, from protein. It just sees it as acetyl-CoA. What it does with it, though, highly depends upon where it's come from. If it's come from carbohydrate and there's a different energy demand, a relatively low energy demand, it will be stored. If it's coming from fat and there's a relatively low energy demand but you're carbohydrate restricted, you'll make it into ketone body. And so there's a number of different ways in which we regulate it. Now, I have to say I'm doing something highly dangerous here. I'm giving a little bit of information, but I'm not giving it all. And I always say a little bit of knowledge is dangerous. All right, but that's because we're, we're a bit stuck for time. But I've got some references at the end that we can leave up that you can go and have a look at. So the other question, though, then, is what, do we, what happens if we go low carb? And there's been a multitude of papers on it. Volek and Finney um, to be, uh, have probably been the most prolific. Um, but there have been a number of others who have particularly looked at it at rest or during exercise. And smiley faces, again, means something's been turned on when you go low carb. The, the block means it's been reduced. 
the glucose, the enzymes and transporters for glucose metabolism in the liver are what we call inducible. That means you don't, you, the amount that you make is highly dependent upon the amount of carbohydrate in your diet. So if you lower the carbohydrate requirement in your diet, your liver does not make as much glucose transporter, it does not make as much glycogen synthase, does not make as much enzyme that drives pyruvate and acetyl-CoA than if you have carbohydrates. It's different with the muscle. The muscle kind of keeps them as a bit of a housekeeping gene and it won't fluctuate that much. However, one, somebody asked before, you know, should you be spiking with your glucose? A single meal with carbohydrate will significantly increase the amount of glycogen synthase enzyme and you'll re replenish your glycogen stores rapidly. Now, most of us will have enough glycogen in our liver to last about 10 hours. So a 10-hour carbohydrate fast and your liver glycogen will be relative, pretty much gone. Because you have a maximum capacity, it's around about 100 grams per kilogram. Most people probably have around about a 1.2 kilo um, liver. You're looking at about 120 grams. It's gone in around about half a day. Which means you're working with, in the liver, only being able to use blood glucose. And if you're bringing that down, then you don't necessarily make glucose transporters because the liver recognises it can live without glucose. It's got a fully functioning mitochondria, it can use fat, it can use protein. And people, as Troy said, people say the brain needs glucose. No, the brain cells, there are brain cells that can quite happily live on ketone bodies. The only cell in our body that has to have glucose is the red blood cell. And the energy requirement for that would be relatively minimal. The other thing that low-carb, um, carbohydrate-restricted diets do, though, that people have shown with their biopsies and what have you, is that you stimulate the enzyme that breaks down fat. You also increase the amount of fat transporters you have on your plasma membrane. And you also increase the rate at which the transport mechanism on the mitochondria can work. So as you restrict the carbohydrate and increase the availability of fat, your mitochondria actually adapts to a point where it handles it far better than it was before. And also we've lost the direct inhibition that we've got from carbohydrates. So we've got a the tap. I'm going to stop there, but we can leave that up there. That looks a bit messy, I know. But if you can't write them down quick enough, I would, I would suggest Google um, Vo Jeff Volek, Stephen Finney, ketones. Google Randall cycle. And then you could also Google um, Romine. Oh, no. Yes, R-O-M-I-J-N and Hargraves and low carb. And you should be able to come up with a plethora of uh, evidence for why you can still live quite happily with your low carb, high fat diet.